Being successful in the camp industry these days calls for strong, courageous leadership. And on Long Island, Mark Transport has made himself known amongst his camp peers, local and state government, and the media. There's a lot to unpack with Mark, so let's get it rolling. This is the Day Camp Pod. Welcome back, my friends, to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. And we are day camp operators dedicated to the professional development of our colleagues, discussing topics and best practices that can improve our organizations and ourselves. And today we are joined by Mark Transport of Crestwood Day Camp on Long Island. And, and by the way, I just have to ask you, Mark, is it Dr. Mark Transport? Because I know you were a dentist. It, it used to be. I used to be a dentist. Wait, you lose your license? You, you, you... <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't think I have a license anymore. And I'll tell you this much, Andy. I don't think you want me practicing dentistry on you because it's been about 13 years. So probably uh, if you want, I'll, I'll try an extraction on you or something. But <laughs> you, might, you might want to avoid that. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I can only imagine the metaphors that you must give your staff when it, oh, when yeah. it comes to that. Yeah. So, um, so, so for people who don't know you, because by the way, Mark, we're listening to in 40 countries on a whole bunch of continents. We're all over the place, right? And not everybody knows you outside of the Northeast. So if you could give the little, you know, the little two minute, you know, how you got into camping and, and how you ended up at Crestwood, that'd be awesome. Well, just, you know, in a nutshell, I'm not going to take too much time because there's a, there's a lot of history, but what mm -hmm. happened is um, I was a dentist for about 26 years, but I was a lifelong camper. I started in day camp. I went a couple of years. And then I went to a resident camp uh, for about 18 straight years. Uh, started as an eight-year-old kid, worked my way up, uh, counselor, group leader, assistant head counselor. Uh, I actually went in between uh, summers in dental school. And I was very friendly with the owner. And everybody said, I'm going to end up owning a camp. And I laughed at them because I never thought that was going to happen. But unfortunately, the, the, the downside is that uh, the owner of my camp had passed away. Um, the camp started to struggle. Some of the family members were trying to, you know, keep it alive. And basically, it was a camp that had, um, you know, close to 400 campers. And by the time they approached us to kind of take over the camp, there was about 150 campers. And, uh, next and, at, and and at this point, you had been a dentist now for 20 plus years. No, I had been a dentist. I had been a dentist actually for maybe 15 or 16 years. Mm -hmm. And so I, I bought the camp with a friend at the time, a couple of friends uh, with the idea. We didn't even buy the land. We, we kind of leased the property and worked at building the camp up. And uh, I ended up uh, ultimately leaving, but that was after I already owned another camp. But when I left, there were about 400 campers again, uh, you know, a very strong product. And uh, we, we found another camp, uh, Camp Taconic in Massachusetts that I ran for many years. A similar story, there were about 190 campers when we took over and when I left and uh, I sold the rest of my shares to my partner's son, um, we had close to 600 campers. Um, what happened is I was doing dentistry in camp uh, for the set, you know, at the same time and started to realize that, you know what, my heart wasn't fully into dentistry. And what happened is most people don't leave professions. Uh, I, my mother wasn't happy at the time. She figured out she paid and I went to dental school and here I am <laughs> about leaving dentistry. But I decided that, you know what, my passion was camp, working with kids and the difference, you know, a lot of differences, but one of the main differences between dentistry and, and camp and a lot of puns could be made there too, was there were days that I went into or work and practice as a dentist that, you know, if I had one or two really kind of pain in the neck patients, it was kind of a horrible day that I didn't look forward to. And I can say to this day, I don't think I've ever had a day that I dreaded going into work in, in camp. Not to say that there aren't busy, difficult days, but every day is surrounded with laughter and, and a certain amount of fun, even on the toughest days. So I'm really happy that I made that decision and um, just to, 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 you know, kind of come full circle to where we are in day camp, uh, when I was uh, at, at, at Taconic and I had been used to kind of going between two camps because I owned Camp Wani at the time too, um, I kind of decided uh, once I left Wani that I wanted another camp and this opportunity came by that was spoken to me about a mutual friend of the owner of Crestwood and myself and um, didn't really say what it, uh, what it was, but they were intimating it was a day camp. 
And I really wasn't interested because I was a resident camp guy. And usually those paths don't cross. Well, because uh, resident people are generally snobs. They think that, you know, that's real camp and day camp were like a fast food, right? But I thought I didn't think that at the time, Andy. So <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> this is, this is, I, I get it all the time. And, and so what happened ultimately, I found out the camp that they were talking about hooking me up with was Crestwood, which was not too far from where I lived and always had a great reputation. I never saw it. And I went to see it and I said, oh my God, this is a, this is a sleepaway camp without a lake. Uh, the only difference between us and you guys at Liberty Lake, you have the lake. But it was it was an awesome place. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of step out of my comfort zone and I'm gonna try day camp. And so I've now been here for 10 years. And uh, I have to say that I have a love for day camp because um, you know, just from the day camp side, as as crazy and as busy the, as the day is. It's nice once in a while to uh, actually end the, the day at a reasonable hour, not at 12 o'clock. <laughs> and, 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 and although, although we, um, you know, we ran this summer, um, but because I was out of the sleepway and of course the sleepway world for the most part wasn't running, I had my first free weekends in, in literally 30 years. And I have to tell you, wasn't not a bad, bad concept. Not bad. Yeah, not bad at all. So, so a couple of things. First, first, just the last time I'm going to talk about the dentistry thing, but it just, I just find it so interesting. So what, when I tell people that, that you were a dentist or that like the camp Pontiac guys were dentists and all, you know, the first thing they say is, is it a feeder system? Do you, do you, is it a, is the dentistry a feeder system to the camp at all? Did you get kids? Were you like telling them about camp while you were like, <laughs> well, <laughs> there were a couple of kids, but I have to say, if you're going into camp and expecting that your dental practice is going to be a feeder system to camp, you're barking up the wrong tree. So it wasn't really anything to write home about. All, All right. right. The, so, the, the, other, the other question I have is that, you know, you, you were like, well, you know, you go to camp and every day is, a, you know, a, a you know, barrel of laughs kind of thing. But, you know, this time of year, okay, so we're having, this, we're doing this podcast right now. It's December 8th. Okay. They come out, these podcasts come out two weeks later, generally. Um you know, it's, it's a slow time of the year. And, and like, you know, when you, when you're a dentist, you know, every day you open up mouth, there's going to be a you know, surprise, like a box of chocolates. Right. Um, whereas, you know, we have to sort of pace ourselves in a way because, you know, those, those four months of like, you know, May through August are so crazy intense, you know, and this time we're almost like a bear hibernating, like to take time to sort of like get into that kind of well, mindset. There is a different ebb and flow in day camp, but I have to say I have it a little different because at Prestwood we have a uh, we have a preschool here, so I have two to five year olds at the a school. We have about 170 kids here, and so I don't have a downtime. But what I will say is I am a beach lover, so if if, if you don't see me around Prestwood somewhere in September and early October, you can bet that I'm at the beach and kind of decompressing because. You know, I, at that point, I, I really kind of need uh, more time. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and I think I'm done speaking to people, although I'm still here the rest of the time. It's, it's nice to have a little bit of downtime. Yes. But there is no question that from a camp point of view, it's, it, you know, this is kind of certainly a quiet time, but I, I'm still busy with the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you do take advantage of living on Long Island, of, of going out to the beach. So that's awesome of you. Um, so, so just, you know, in regard to that transition from sleepaway camp to day camp, right? So when you were having, you, you know, you're, you're getting your first experience of the whole day camp thing that first summer, what aspects of sleepaway camp do you feel are important for day camp people to bring so to get that sleepaway camp spirit so that we're doing sleepaway camp light, you know, in a way. It's a great question because, you know, to me, having been in the sleepaway world probably for 40 some odd years in some capacity or another before I came to Crestwood, uh, you know, I had some preconceived notions as, as to what the most important aspects of camp are. And having not been through a summer of, of day camp until, you know, as I said, literally 10 years ago, um, I kind of took it in the first summer and, and, and the things that I felt that were missing uh, that I wanted to change were a couple of things. One is uh, I, I thought that uh, I wanted to have a higher level of professional instruction. Uh, Sleepaway Camp is really known for more specialists out there teaching the sports and the different activities where a lot of camps, and I know that's changed, but a lot of camps, the counselors tend to lead a lot of the activities. And I was very specific in making sure that I had a, um, you know, a, a whole staff that would teach sports 
and other activities much different than they've done before in, this, in, the, in the day camp world. And the other is at least Crestwood was missing certain spirit type of items like a color war. Uh, I know some day camps have it, and I think some day camps are looking to be kind of like sleepaway camp light or, or, or mm -hmm. something of the sure. sort. And so, you know, bringing things like uh, color war to camp was something that I always felt was a real important culmination that kind of wraps up all the things that you do in the summer and gives kids something to look forward to and to end on a high note. And uh, we, we brought that. I didn't really want to use the term color war because it's, if you haven't had it in your culture, in this day and age, the, the, the word war is kind of a, a negative term. So we call it Crestwood Games, but in essence, it's color war. And we have breakout, you know, we have uh, uh, the helicopters and the planes and the tanks and, and, and all that fun stuff and team leaders and, and tug of wars and musical chairs and all the sports. And it's a really, it's a really great end. And it just, uh, it just ends the camp on a, on a very high note. Yeah. And, and I know, you know, Mark and I have visited each other's camps and, you know, Liberty Lake is in a, is in a community where there's a, there's a camp culture that is, it's not that much of a camp culture, frankly. And because of that, we tend to have a lot of older kids, whereas Mark's camp has, it's a large camp, it's over a thousand kids. Um, and, and the bulk of them are little, right. <laughs> they are little kids. Right. And, and, and when you take things like, you know, color war type stuff, you know, there's an art to downscaling it and making it palatable for little kids. Well, that's why that's why I kind of uh, eased it up with calling it Crestwood Games rather than Color War, because let's put it this way. You can't have the same intensity with, uh, you know, three, four, five and six year olds that you would with kids that are normally in sleepaway camp. Or as, a, as you said, in your camp, your kids tend to be a little bit older. What happens is whether it's a challenge or not, I'm coming from camp country. And for the most part, many of the kids somewhere by around eight or nine, most of them are off to a uh, sleepaway camp. But there are certainly uh, older kids, and I do have teen programs here, and, and, and we do programs accordingly, but a good part of my population is off to the, um, to the resident camp experience. Yeah. Mark, does your preschool feed your camp or your camp feed your preschool? You know, it's an interesting thing because what happens is the, the, um, the preschool kind of feeds camp. Um, there are a lot of people that, you know, have given up on, on school because it's not really a, a great moneymaker in, in the camp business. But what it does do is it keeps your uh, a facility open year round. Um, it, 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 what happens is people have a buy-in. They understand what we're doing. And in addition, uh, there are a lot of cultures that don't quite get the camp experience but they do get the education experience. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of demographic that really never came to camp. A, a lot of the South Asian and Asian communities that didn't get camp have come to school and they've bought in and they're now a part of camp and, and telling friends about it. And I would say that from the school, probably over 90% of the people in school come to camp. So school is a feeder to camp uh, rather than the other way around, although there is some of that as well, but it's certainly more the school to camp end. Well, th that's a very high number that you got there of, of school kids going to camp, because I know a lot of people in your situation where it's, it's not as great. Um, no, it, it isn't. A lot of camps might be about 50%. And yeah. to be quite honest, Andy, I'm not even sure why it's so high, but we're, we're very fortunate. And part of it might be our teachers are, are, are a lot of our key counselors in those younger grades in mm -hmm. camp and so they they naturally feel very um you know very comfortable making that transition because they know who's going to be taking their care of their kids in the summer as well yeah i, I think that's a that's a huge point it's always a goal for us too to get different cultures in and that's very interesting that that brought in another culture for you yeah uh, it's brought in a number of cultures and i have to say that um many of us in the camp world have tried sometimes in vain, I think we're being more successful now in kind of spreading the word because look, what's good for kids is good for kids of, of, of every demographic. And um, the things that we do in terms of giving kids a, a sense of uh, responsibility and, 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 and thinking out of the box and uh, you know, just uh, you know, being having that sense of independence, you can't do that in other programs. Camp is the best at it. And, and sometimes parents don't understand it until they've lived it with their kids and they see it firsthand. And then they get it. You can't always explain it beforehand, but once they've lived the summer, oh, that's what you're talking about. Yes, I've seen the growth in my child and, and, and then they're sold. 
I got it. So, so one thing I want to talk to you about that you've had a unique experience with is turning things around, right? Turning these camps around. So you've now been a part of like three or four camp situations where you've come in. And um, as we see in a lot of camps, when the same leadership is, is in place for a very long time and they don't do a good job of transitioning new people in, it starts going down the tubes. Okay. And now here you come into into a situation and by the way i'm not saying that that was the case in crestwood i don't think i think crestwood was a different situation but um yeah but um what are the typical kind of things that you have seen when you've come into these situations like that sort of seem obvious to you but when there's a culture that's been the same for 20 years people don't see it it's the same as people who have lived in a house for 20 years they forget to see what's falling apart they don't see that the paint is chipping, that the, maybe the outside, the shingles are falling off. They become comfortable. Um, it's, it, it, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a world where people are very discerning. And you have to either on your own be able to take a look um, very carefully as to what is, is not up to par and or have people who are willing to do it uh, and really understand what is it about, first of all, your facility that is kind of keeping you uh, down from your competition. But it's not only that, it's the people that are working there. Are people um, just committed to work there because they've been there for a lot of years? Or, they, or, or do they want the best for the community? And I'm talking about the camp community where they're understanding that change is, is, is kind of a scary word for some people, but without change these days, especially, all you can do, I think, is to, is to kind of go downhill. And you have to be willing to change because there are different needs. Um, you know, camp, there was a time, you know, Andy, camp was, you know, if it was day camp, it was eight weeks. That's it. You either come the whole summer yep. and, uh, and, and, and you're set. Well, we know we're not at the point where we're uh, taking kids for a, a couple of days or a week, but there are very few camps that are not having sessions at three weeks, two weeks, four weeks, five weeks. Uh, we're accommodating the needs of people. That's only one example of change. But activity-wise, things have changed. Uh, the focus of, of what we're doing with children, things have changed. And I think that you have to, the most important thing is you have to call out what is being done right and what needs to change. And it's a difficult balance. And not every staff member goes along with that. But I have to say, the thing that I've been fortunate in Crestwood is that I came in as the guy with this new set of eyes in not only the facility, but what we're doing in terms of programming and just a general feel. And you know what? I could have been met with a lot of, uh, of, of you know- you know Resistance, yeah. Yeah, but, but I have to say people were on board and excited because they realized that uh, the, the change was not something that was forced upon them, but something that we could all self-reflect on and say, what, what are areas that we can do better? And I think the better camps, and I know you're that way at Liberty Lake, Andy, um, if you're not willing to reflect and say, okay, it was a great summer, terrific. Now, what can we do better? Yeah. And, and if, you're, if you're not willing to do that, I, I think you have a problem. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, I've had, we had this discussion recently with Jonathan Gold when he was talking about how people spend a lot of money on a lot of things just because it's quote unquote tradition. I think a lot of these, a lot of these things that have been going on for years that a lot of camp people they, they think of them as traditions and they don't want to mess with them, even though they're not great <laughs> or they're not great anymore. Times have passed. You shouldn't be doing that anymore kind of thing. You should be changing on it. I think it's so hard for people when you're on the inside to look from the outside in. You know, Andy, it, it, here's an interesting thing. You know, I went, to, I went to camp for lots of years, literally, as I said, 18 years when I was younger. And um, I was one of those traditional, like everyone else, kids, like keep everything the same. You know, campers, especially in resident camp, oh, you know, if you, if you move one thing, you, you move one piece of equipment, they're like, why'd you do that? I mean, they're used to everything being set. Exactly. And what happened is I remember when I was about, uh, I don't know, about 14 or 15, uh, I had a head counselor that came in that was brand new there. And um, he met a lot of resistance because he was into a lot of change. He was a he was actually a, a, a basketball coach in the Ivy Leagues, really bright guy, went to Brown. He was, a, you know, a, 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 an all time collegiate player and just one of these guys that just didn't accept things to status quo. And it made a big impact on me because he used to ask, OK, fine, tradition, explain why this is better than what I'm, I'm saying. And I would, I would look at some things even at a, a younger age and go, Jesus, I don't really have an argument for him. 
uh, maybe, maybe change is not such a bad idea. And I think, I remember even at that early age, he made an impression on me and that, you know what? People shouldn't fear change. Um, you have to sometimes ask, is tradition just for tradition's sake or is it actually good and safe and the yeah. right thing for children? Yeah. That, 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 is, that, is, that is a risky question in a lot of camps, especially when you're talking about camps that have been owned by the same family for generations. Right. And and well, great grandpa did it this way. Like, how could we change, you know, and then the camp families go all nuts about, you know, change. I remember when I was um, <laughs> we, we, we hit this moment with a with a topic um, when I was working with Jay Jacobs uh, 20 years ago. And um, and I oh, I remember what it was. He was talking about air conditioning the bunks. Right. Um, and, and look, you know, it doesn't even hardly ever get hot up in the, you know, in, in Wayne County, Pennsylvania anyway. And, and Jay said, you know what? He goes, I guarantee that when the first camp decided to put bathrooms in the bunks, that there were people going, what are you doing? We all love going outside and going to the bathroom. We've been doing it for 50 years, right? And now they're thrilled with it, right? But, you know, you got to get over that hump. Right. right. Yes. I, I, I have I have this pin here. Uh, you can see the people that are watching on YouTube. It says, but we've always done yeah. it this way. Perfect. Right. And, and this is like uh, everyone in my uh, organization has one of these like at their desk because I never want to hear it because I started my camp 20 years ago and I never wanted to be in that situation where people are like, well, we've, that's, we've always done it that way because I got so used to hearing that at the camps I was at. Yeah. But Andy, Andy, you have the benefit is you didn't always do it that way because you started it. Exactly. I'm so, lucky. I'm lucky. I feel bad for the people who are, you know, trying to change things, you know, in, in big organizations. The um, good thing about this summer is we had to make some changes uh, and absolutely. then it Absolutely. It actually made me reevaluate some things that maybe I had fallen into uh, to set a routine for, and this I'll be different going forward. We need well, to know what, you know what's interesting. This summer forced us into reevaluating the whole program. Nobody really wanted to do that, but we were forced to do that. And I would say that there were certainly things that we found that we did because we didn't even look at you know certain things like the way we arranged the seating for for lunch or or how we served certain things, but because of COVID and we had to have certain protocols, I will tell you there's a whole handful of things that we did because we kind of had to change it. We go, I don't know why we didn't do it all the time because we're not going back. Now that we saw something that worked better, that's the way we're gonna go no matter what this world looks like. And I certainly hope it looks a lot better this yeah. summer than last than I kind of suspect it will. I think Sam, I'm, I'm going to, after this episode, I'm going to go to my music uh, f like uh, building area and take out like a little triangle. And every time we talk about, every time we talk about something about these silver linings of 2020, I'm going to like ring it because every episode we, we come across these things where it's just like, yeah, absolutely. It got everybody to think out of the box. It got everybody to break like the glass, you know, of, of their of their thinking. I think that's that's so important. And, and just, you know, along the lines of what you're talking about there, Mark, when I hire somebody like a, an experienced person that's worked at other camps, when I hire them at my camp, I look at them in the eye and I'm like, you have special powers this summer because you're going to be coming into my camp with experience and know-how from other places. And you're going to see things that are done here. I want you to tell me when something looks messed up. I want you to tell me if you've seen it done better elsewhere, because all my people that have been here for years, they can't, they are physically and mentally unable to, because we are on the inside looking out, right? No, Andy, you, you hit a great point. Um, a lot of people try and circle the wagons and just have their staff. I find, I agree with you, having people that have worked at other camps and the fact that I've been involved in more than one camp brings a certain perspective. But hiring people um, that have worked at other camps that have another way of looking at things is, is critical. And, and, and not, to, not, to, not to sound too, you know, kind of crazy here, but, you know, your brother worked for me for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, at Crestwood and he worked at a number of camps and it was like a breath of fresh air because he had some things that nobody thought about because let's put let's be fair there are a lot of people that do things very well and they might have looked at some area that you never really dissected and they have a better way to do it and what's better than having a perspective of once again somebody coming in looking and saying hey how come you do it this way we did it this you know this way at another camp and you go Wait a minute. That sounds like that sounds like it's it's much easier to do. Let's yeah. do it now. Yeah. Of course, you, you have to have 
you know, kind of the cojones to do it. But I find it incredibly refreshing. And I, I would certainly, um, you know, uh, recommend to anybody that when you're hiring, if you have the ability to get a couple of people that spend some time at another camp and they seem on the ball, that might be one of the best things you can do. Absolutely. And, and when I lose a kid to sleepaway camp, when one of my kids says, um, we're going, going to sleepaway camp, I say, that's great. You know what your job is for the next bunch of years that you're away? You are an undercover spy for <laughs> Liberty Lake. OK, and when you come back and work for me as a counselor, I want you to come back and give me all the best ideas from the sleepaway camp that you went to. And has that worked, Andy? Yeah, that's great. They, they come they, they come back and they're like, oh, you know what we did for Color War at this place? We did this and we did this crazy thing with our sneakers and all that. And I'm like, oh, you know, because like you said, there's so many ways to do this. You right. know, I mean, that's the beauty. That's why we do this podcast, you know, is sharing ideas like, you know. Well, so you know, it, it goes full circle that I, I think one of the things I like about this industry and I'm going to I'm going to mention dentistry one more time because you weren't going to. But I am. I was a solo. <laughs> everything I did. Yeah, there was a couple of courses and everything, but most most other professions are, are kind of restrictive and people you know, want to protect what they have. The great thing about this industry is there are so many channels to share you know, best practices, whether it's the camp tours, whether it's in Tri-State through the years, whether it's, whether it's you know, this whole uh, you know, uh, you know, series of, of, of podcasts that you're doing. You know, what, kind of, what kind of industry is as open as the camp industry? And I, and, I, and I have to say, anybody in this industry that doesn't think they owe something to someone else for some of the ideas they have, it's either they're living in a hole yeah. or, or, or they're just not going to admit it. But the great thing about this is you can never really steal a full camp, but you, you can take some ideas <laughs> and, 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 and propagate them to, to your facility and to your situation yeah. and make it such that, all right, you, 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 you took a great idea from someone else, but you're adapting it to your situation. Yeah, I, I, I do have to put a plug in for women in camp conference last week. Um, I get to do one of the mentoring jobs and I had a whole lot of young professionals saying, you know, what's my, what should I do to make, become successful? And it, I kept telling them, go to a lot of different situations, a lot of different camps, pick what you like, pick what you don't like um, to make it your own because that variety of experience is so important. Yeah. Well, I wasn't a dentist. I was a musician but in my prior life. And, and I always say that we are like a bunch of jazz musicians, camp directors, and, and we're basically, uh, we're, we're, we're borrowing riffs from each other, right? When you're a musician, you hear a jazz musician play, very often they'll, they'll play things that, and real musicians go, oh, you hear that? He just played the Charlie Parker riff kind of thing, right? And we're all just reinterpreting it in our own songs. Right. And then also, you know, when it comes to sharing and I agree 100 percent, Mark, like, you know, I came up with Ben Applebaum and he was all about sharing. But um, I, um, I Peter Ross from 829 Studios. Right. He speaks at every conference he can. And he tells all about web stuff and searches and like he gives every secret in the world. And I'm like, Peter, how the hell do you do this? Like you're giving everybody your secrets away. And he's like, yeah, he goes, but nobody's going to be able to do it. Nobody's going to execute it the way I do. <laughs> so I'm happy to tell them what I do <laughs> because actually doing it is another story, right? Fair point. You know, the, you know, the people can see what's going on. Doesn't mean they can uh, certainly carry it out the way uh, people have been. Yeah, doing for years. Uh, I got everything on my website. Anybody wants to know about what I do, just go to my Liberty Lake website. It's all there. All right. So before we go on, Mark, all right, we have to we have to talk about our sponsor. Who you know, someone's that uh, that you are a client as well. AM Skyer. OK, so, you know, one of, the, one of the greatest insurance companies in the country for over 100 years, um, and they are more than an insurance company is what we always talk about. Right. They have all these different people, um, whether it's PR and legal and medical, they, they got an expert for almost every aspect of camp to help support us. And, and they're sort of like, you know, they call them AM Sky or partners. Right. And that, that's sort of how, how I feel about it. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention today, I wanted to see, do you have a camp safety person? Did you ever put anybody through the camp safety officer program they have, the Gene Uzerski program? Uh, I think Mark did years ago. Yeah, so I just took one of my uh, like star college students, going to be a school teacher, like hopefully this kid's with me for the next 30 years. Um, and I'm looking for extra things for him to do. And I enrolled him in the safety officer program. I mean, it was only a few hundred bucks. And right. he's taking courses with my man, Dave Malter you know, through that, uh, right. that, uh, that program out there. And, um, and he's going to be a great asset in the summer for me. Um, so just, you know, one of the many things that Skyer does. Well, of I, I can only say having been in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, great uh, industry for years. Unfortunately, there are times that you need uh, all kinds of help from an insurance company, and I'm no exception. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, through the years, I've dealt with fire. I've dealt with a couple of tough situations with uh, families or staff members. I've dealt with, um, you know, all kinds of windstorms, uh, hurricane damage, et cetera. And um, you know what? Things that you've never gone through at all, and they seem to have all the answers. And I have to say, from my point of view, there are certain things that you could say, well, you're buying a car, you're buying a TV, you're just shopping price, et cetera. But hardly a, a, a week or a month goes by where I don't need some legal uh, advice or something. And it's nice because, as you say, that Sky team has something for every, every situation. And uh, to this point, knock wood, there hasn't been anything that's come up where there hasn't been you know, a, a real quick, easy solution or, or at least a solution. Some of them are not easy, but the solution is right there. And uh, that certainly makes, takes a lot of the stress off of running a camp because a lot of people say, you know, what, 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 you know, running a camp, you must be out of your mind to understand the liability, et cetera. And I think when you have good partners in terms of uh, at camp, in terms of staff, but also in terms of an insurance company, it's nice to know what, what, what you have behind you. All right. So AM Sky, are you going to knock off some of our premiums this year? Because that was, <laughs> it's supposed to be a one minute commercial and you got a solid three there. All right. So, um, Moving, moving on. So, so let's talk about summer 2020 just for a little bit. Um, so, so Mark Transport is the only person I know who might have been on TV as much as I was last spring. We were going back and forth. We would send each other links. Hey, check this out. Check this out. We were patting each other on the back the whole time. It was, it was really great. Um, so, you know, um, <clears throat> New York camps. It, you know, as Mark was saying before he got on the show with us, um, they had it even tougher than New Jersey camps in a way because their governor was just a, a little more worried up until, you know, gave them a lot less time to prepare to start uh, the uh, the season and, and even went on record and in, in saying some offhanded things about how he wouldn't send his kid to camp you know, and that kind of thing. And it just made it tough. And, and you know, Mark was leading the charge um, for a lot of people of trying to just trying to keep everybody positive. Keep them moving forward. Keep them optimistic. We can do it, and all that kind of thing. And I just want to say thank you to to you know all all of our colleagues out there who who are helping follow suit. And and I just wanted to give you a you know a moment to talk about it if you'd like. Well, I'll tell you, there was uh, there, I don't think there was anyone in this industry that somewhere say in April wasn't kind of panicked that we didn't know if they would we'd ever open again. Mm -hmm. I mean, things were pretty bleak. Uh, myself included. Sure. But, but you know, there started to be some talk about how this, you know, curve was going to be flattened out and, and, and on the downturn. And of course, there was no talk of any vaccines or anything at that point. But it became clear there was going to be some point during the summer, not we didn't know exactly when, where we would have numbers that we would be capable of opening. And between uh, recommendations from the CDC and the American Camp Association and the local health departments, I felt, here's what, what, what was in my mind. We know how valuable camp has been for all the years when it, it was kind of like a normal world out there. What are we doing for kids in the best of times? Well, here kids have been sequestered at home for months. Uh, we know that it's an incredible psychological difficulty and just socially and everything else, I felt it was our responsibility as, as, as camp owners to provide what we did, and even then some. I felt it was the, before the summer started, I felt this was gonna be the most important summer that we ever had. And there were a lot of doubters saying, how could you even be thinking about opening? Nobody's talking about that stuff. And I was personally laser focused on, we're opening, now I will jump through any hoop and figure out whatever roadblock I have to come up against to figure out how we're going to open. And there was certainly a lot of protocols. And in essence, what you alluded to in New York, we had pretty much three weeks to reinvent camp, which is incredible in and of yeah. itself. But we did it in conjunction with a whole host of camps on Long Island and ultimately joined with other camps on Zooms that you know, we were running you know, uh, each week, talking about every problem as a group, uh, working in unison so that we didn't have a situation where Camp X across the street was doing something completely different from Camp Y. It was important to have a basic standard that every camp could live by so that we felt 
It, we couldn't have a situation that summer, last summer, where um, maybe, you know, people would say normally, oh, well, here are a couple of camps that are thriving and doing well, but here are a whole bunch of other camps that are closing because they have all these outbreaks of virus. Well, that's not good for the industry as a whole. So we actually expanded our circle as large as we could do. And, and what was great, and once again, it's, it's, it's really a kudos to this industry, is share as much stuff as we could and everybody really was on the same page. And you know what, by gone, you know, when, when the summer was all over, there isn't a camp director that opened that didn't say it was the most impactful summer that they ever had. Not, not the best financially, for sure, mm -hmm. no way. but uh, never was there a summer where there was more satisfaction in terms of campers, in terms of parents, and even more so, which is kind of crazy, but the staff couldn't have been happier with having <laughs> a sense of purpose after all these months. It was incredible. It really was. So uh, by the way, I'm ringing the little bell, right? The silver linings. Um, Mark is in a very, very competitive area. Okay. You know, Long Island, Westchester, you know, um, Rockland, these people fight over kids in Manhattan, like there's nothing and, and like it's nobody's business. And yeah, they all came together and you had camps and directors that weren't, that wouldn't even ever pick up the phone for each other that were working side by side with each other. It was really, really nice to see. So another, another great silver lining. And, and I really got to hand it to you guys in that, you know, New Jersey, we were given some, some, you know, comparatively great, you know, situations where we could have 20 kids in a group. The group did not have to wear a mask or socially distance with each other. Right. I mean, that was wonderful to be able to have that New York. There were like 12 kids in a group. Everybody's got to wear a mask, tough crap. And you guys were like, okay, like what else you got? We'll, we'll do it. Like, you know, if that's what we got to do, we're going to freaking do it. And, and, and I love the attitude. And you guys are a bunch of stubborn SOBs. And it was great to see you guys pull through. And, and, and you know, it's there's probably no other place in the country, Mark, where the majority of camps opened. The majority. Yeah. Right? It was the I mean, vast majority, really. Yeah, the vast majority, right? Whereas 70% of camps in America did not open. And granted, the sleep, most of the sleepaway camps could not open. They weren't even legally allowed to open, right? I mean, it was like 90% of the day camps on Long Island opened. I mean, it was really something to, uh, to see. You know, so, so well, it's, it's, there's an awesome bunch there. And once again, once we were kind of, you know, as a group determined that we're going to figure out a way to get this done, really what the last element was, was just to see if the governor was openly going to allow us to open. Now, as you alluded to, uh, in late May, he had said, if I had kids of camp age, I wouldn't send them. He ended up uh, after the first week of June, and that's where we had the three weeks, we ended up opening a week, a week late. But at the end of June said, okay, camps are going to open. And instead of saying, all right, well, camps are going to open. I feel, I feel okay. We have the right protocol. He just said, camps will open. <laughs> didn't, 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 didn't go into the same reverse of being somewhat, you know, uh, uh, beneficial to us by saying, okay, we, we, we're comfortable. There's a reason we're opening camps. And I know a lot of people didn't participate for, for that reason in and of itself. But, um, but, you know, a lot of what you need to do in, in, in this type of adversity is kind of, uh, you know, intestinal fortitude. It's, it's grit. And um, you know what? I grew up in the Bronx. I grew up in the city. Uh, I went to camp. I wasn't the best athlete. I was an average athlete. As a matter of fact, I was really so-so in a lot of the key sports. But one thing I was, I was the guy out there diving for balls. Uh, I, you know, I, I learned in the city, you know, like I didn't know what a grass uh, uh, athletic field was when you grow up in the city the schoolyard it's it's concrete and asphalt right. so if you're playing football you're diving on asphalt when i came out to long island i said what is this they have like grass fields That's crazy <laughs> stuff. um but but i think i learned that 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 uh, intensity and that grit which unfortunately i think to a degree is lacking a little bit in kids these days but of just being able to just grin and bear it and get kicked in the teeth a little bit and just pick yourself up and find a way to, to continue the game or to continue life or to continue uh, figuring out what you're doing in your business. Yeah. Yeah. And look, a lot of camps that chose not to open, they had their reasons and, and a lot of them are pretty happy that they did it, you know, that they didn't open at all. And that's, and that's wonderful for them. But for the camps that did open, I do think that you hit on a good point there, Mark, that a lot of people that found themselves in those situations to make that decision, the ones that open, a lot of those people were people who have gone through some rites of passage, right? They've, they've taken some hits in the teeth in life and it sort of prepared them 
for this, right? If this was the first, if this was the first crazy thing that you were dealing with in your life, this that would be a very hard thing to do, right? Because you know, we're sitting here like you know, patting ourselves on the back, but at the same time, it was hard as hell. You know, it was brutal. It, you know what? It was brutal. And I have to say, as much as I kept a stiff upper lip and a positive attitude, I can assure you there were nights that like my head was spinning, wondering how we're gonna possibly pull this off. It was it, it seemed like insurmountable odds at a time. But you know, the interesting thing is when people ask me, you know, just to get to the, to the crux of camp, what is the most important thing that camp teaches kids? Um, I think it teaches them the ability to fail. Think of all the activities and things that we do and how many kids, you know it, how many kids are successful or great at all the things that we have to offer? Yeah. None. Uh, and so throughout the day, most kids are not necessarily being the best or even being necessarily successful. Right. They're but striking that, out. They're striking out. They're yeah. not getting to the top of the of the climbing wall. They're failing the swim test. Yeah, it's right. happening all day. So if, 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 if we're imparting that at least that ability, which, you know, because everybody's praised for everything and, uh, you know, and, and they're going to camp and they're trying things and they're not necessarily being successful. But before they can think about it, they're on to the next activity and then maybe doing good. And then they have like kind of the, the you know, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the mental ability to kind of face that that failure again. I, I think that might be the thing that we as camp uh, 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 facilities and, and, and camping institution in general is providing for kids that that I don't think it's happening anywhere else. No, I think that's uh, that's profound. That's true. So I was joking around at the beginning after the after our extended commercial for AF Sky that um, we, that you were on TV all the time. So so I just you know I, I find it sort of like I find it entertaining that here's this guy. He was a dentist in his solo practice, you know, and now there he is talking to the media and and like you did a very very good job. And and I think that. Um, it behooves camp professionals to work on their talking skills in front of people and stuff like that. So that when you get into those situations, you can knock it out of the park because it, it you know, just a short 15, 30 second thing out there can mean a lot to get that word out. Well, it's, I think it's incumbent on all of us to be able to reach out and get the word out uh, to our communities, to our legislators, et cetera. You know, the interesting thing is if you ask me what was the weakest aspect of, of, of my being uh, when I was younger, I, I didn't have a need, it would be talking to a, a large group of people. And I was not good at it until, you know, working at camp and, and directing camps for a number of years. It's, some, it's not something that comes natural to most people. Some people it does. But I, I would usually like kind of like sweat profusely if the, the thought of even sure. being in front of a camera or speaking to a large group of people. But you know what? You don't have the luxury in camp to uh, to do that before you know it. There are lots of things that you got to lead a group. And, um, you know, after a while, you become pretty good at it. And uh, I have to say, I don't know why, but, you know, that fear was gone and uh, it certainly wasn't a problem. And I felt that every opportunity that any of us had to get in front of a camera i wasn't representing crestwood i was representing the camp industry right and that message had to come across that hey we're, we're there we're concerned about your child's safety we're concerned about your child's health we're concerned about your child's mental health but we have a way to take care of your children that no one else can and and and, and thankfully um that's exactly what happened and when you're passionate about your subject and you live it every day, it's a lot easier to communicate that to people in general. Yeah. Well, you know that's, what? A, that's a good point. The, the, the key to that point, it's, it's, it's also all of us, in a sense, obviously have to sell camp. We're, we're doing tours. We're, we're, we're having people come through our camp and, and deciding whether they're going to come. And, you know, through the years, people say, you know, you know, you're a good salesman. And I said, no, I'm not a good salesman. A good salesman can sell, sell ice to an Eskimo in a, in, in a blizzard. I can't, I can't sell it all. It's that we believe in our product and it's not selling. It's just, it, it comes across. It should come across that that's part of you. It's, it's like an extension of my whole life and my body. So yeah. um, those of us in, in, in camping that believe in what we do for kids, it, it should come pretty naturally. Well, I think that you're a great example. If I was running a media course in, in college and I said like how to talk to the media, a very, very important part of it is to be yourself right? And don't sound like you're scripted and don't just sit there and, and try to nail the bullet points. And it's really hard because, you know, ACA will give you some bullet points on to, hey, make sure you talk about this, make sure you talk about that. And that makes it tougher when you can just talk passionately about what you want 
it just it it flows and 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 not being too stressed you know sort of just being able to, to sort of isolate the moment and just and just talk and and just like anything else mark you know you talked about when you were a kid you know public speaker wasn't your thing i don't think it's natural by the way for anybody to do it i don't i think it is a skill that you develop plain and simple just like any just like shooting a basketball and and the more you do it the better you get so Put yourselves, my young camp director friends, um, put yourselves in situations where you're talking to groups of people, where you are stressed out and all that kind of thing. Because every time you do it, it gets a little easier. No question. Right. All right. So we are going to head to the tip of the week. And uh, before I do that, I just want to talk about our other sponsor, CRS, Commercial Recreation Specialist. That's right. So I had a long talk yesterday with my man, Rich Wills and his buddy, Ron. Right. And they told me about this amazing new product that you're all going to hear about really soon. I talked about it a few uh, episodes ago. It's called Playtech. Okay, so this Playtech product, are you ready for this, Mark? All right, it uses this, this, uh, this chemical called concrobium, okay, which is actually, it it's actually, it, it's, it's, it sounds like something the Avengers should be saving the universe from, right? But it's actually, it's, it's derived, it's botanically derived. It comes from thyme, T-H-Y-M-E, right? It's a thyme-based formula. It's non-flammable, it's non-corrosive, it's no ammonia, it's no dyes, right? It's, there's no PPE required to use this stuff. And it disinfects everything for 90 days. It stays on what you use. You could, you could spray it on a picnic table. You could spray it on a playground. And for 90 days, it, it, it will kill germs. It like has little spikes in it that kills the germs. Now, you still have to clean things, okay? But this is a disinfectant that sticks on, and it does not cost a million dollars. It doesn't. You're going to be able to buy it in like 50-gallon things or five gallon things and the concentrate and then you mix water with it and you'll be able to spritz it all over the place. They put it on the bottom of like water trampolines and and the stuff comes right off. Like you'll people are going to be using this way past pandemics. So they're they're called Playtech is the is the company that it's used and it's and the and you're going to be getting information on this soon enough because it is a game changer. I think that sounds pretty awesome. Yeah it is a game changer. I know it sounds it's so good it sounds like fake news. Right. But I'm, I'm telling you that if this is true, if this is what it is, right, then you're going to be negligent if you don't have this at your camp, plain and simple, because it's going to it's going to really make cleaning the bathrooms and all that kind of thing a heck of a lot easier. All right. Um, also, so before we get to our day camp tip of the week, we are doing this show. Most of you who listen to us regularly probably realize we're doing this show one person short right? Our lovely co-host Tiff McDuffie is not with us. She was sick today, right? And, uh, you know, she's still getting paid for the episode because, you know, all the money we make doing this, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, anyway, I just want to give a shout out to Tiff. So Sam, if you could chime in on this, in that Tiff, was, she came onto us like as a full-time co-host this year. She replaced our man, Aaron, who had been with us for a couple seasons. And, um, and she is just, she's just a breath of fresh air. Like, you know, when she opens her mouth and talks about stuff, like it's just, to me, it's really insightful. It's really wonderful. And coming from an urban camp setting and the fact that she is sort of a camp outsider that sort of found her way into camping. Um, um, I think that she adds a lot to the show and I'm just super grateful for her. She always says she's an accountant by trade, right? But ended up in camp. Well, yeah, we're if, missing if, you today, way, Tiff. If, if there's anything more boring than a dentist, it's an accountant. But I'll. Just... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's why she stuck with the camping thing, um, and that's why my wife is a is a accountant auditor kind of person. That's why we make a good yin and yang too, because you got to have that balance. Right. All right. So the day camp tip of the week, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So I'm going to go first. Um, my day camp tip of the week, just going back to uh, one of the first things that Mark was talking about, the turnaround artist stuff, right? So when Jay Jacobs came in and bought North Shore Day Camp when I was there, it was a very similar situation where he came in and we thought we were doing great, you know? And he was just like, whoa, you know, we need to change some things here. And, um, and what he did is he actually brought in Joanna Warren Smith for a week. Right now, Joanna Warren Smith, if those of you guys don't know her, she's a camp consultant, lives out in California, a lovely, awesome woman, super smart and a real business savvy person. And, and what she did was sort of examine all the elements of what we were doing from the moment somebody calls. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, the moment somebody calls. Because what was happening in this camp organization is that everybody was answering the phone a different way. You know, and, and I think this is a huge issue nowadays where young people, you bring a 20 year old into the office, right? They don't even, they're not even used to talking on the phone, 
they, the phones are for texting. They're not for talking, right? And they answer the phone like a bunch of like, you know, <laughs> I, I hate to use bad words, but you know, so, um, so what she got us to do right away, it was just the first little quickie thing is that you say <clears throat> the name of the camp and, and this is whoever it is. So when people answer the phone at Liberty Lake, they say, Liberty Lake, this is Andy plain and simple. And, and, you know, sometimes people are like, well, I don't want to have to tell people what to say. I want it to be natural. I'm like, no, no, no. Tell them what to say. And then it actually sounds professional. And it actually takes out the element of them going, mm, what am I going to say? I want to sound professional. And, and, it, and, and we did it. And, and just immediately, it just sort of, it, it just helped us, our trajectory in changing and becoming a more professional place. That is my tip. Sam, we're on to you. All right. Well, you know, I always go back to programming Love it. and <laughs> three of my four sites has fishing and it's catch and release. But um, for a while there, I was going out every morning to the bait shop and getting live worms and it gets expensive. Their worms are expensive. Yes. Um, yeah. So we finally figured out that cans of corn, um, if you just put a few kernels of corn on your hook, um, you catch just as many fish. Yeah. So we started buying cans of corn for each site and they last a long time and the kids aren't as worried about putting them on the hook and it works. I would think that it's a little more dangerous to put a piece of corn on a hook <laughs> than, than a worm though. That seems like a... You know, you got to have some good fine motor skills. Right. Right. I'd be a big ear of corn, big ear. <laughs> and I guess my question is, did you put just one kernel or you put no, multiple? Multiple kernels, but we, you know, we teach them not to put their finger on the end, mm -hmm. to do it from the side and pull it up. That way they don't, you know, skewer themselves. And another, uh, another money saving tip yeah. from Sam Thompson, ladies and gentlemen, Blood right? A can of corn, it'll cost you 50 cents. It's got like, uh, you could probably catch 52 fish from that yep. can of corn. <laughs> All right, Mark. Bring it home. Well, norm normally I would be talking about something facility-wise because I have a love for facility. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of facility work at all the camps I've been at. But I think facility facility stuff is kind of going to go out the window for a while because I don't see a lot of people, <laughs> uh, you know, spending a, a lot of money on on facility. But I'm going to kind of do two things because I'm just going to throw this out there because people don't think about this. This is just a facility thing that you don't have to spend a million dollars on. And then I'm going to tell you at least what I think the real tip is. Um, go to your camp and examine, uh, and, and I don't know if we're going to have any visitation this summer because it might be a summer like last, but it's something to think about moving forward. Just go and see what your public bathrooms are and see the worst one. And I believe that your camp is evaluated by the, the best of your worst bathroom, your public bathroom. And people don't think about that, but when people travel and they're, and they're going to a hotel or a garage and they, they, or whatever it is, uh, I mean, a, a, a filling station or a rest stop. Everybody always comments on, on a bathroom and people don't think about it. And they, it's one of those forgotten things. But just remember that people are going to think a lot about what you do by how you take care of your bathrooms and what they look like. So that's that's one tip. Now that we're going to get away from- Wait, something. wait, just one comment on that. Yeah. All right. You ever yeah. been to Paris? Yes. You ever go to the bathrooms on the streets there, the public bathrooms? No, unbelievable. Oh my gosh, they're unbelievable. Good. Like they, they got they're sort of like porta john things, but they're deluxe little Taj Mahals. So and you, you buy, got, but, but, so and you you got to pay, pay, and you got to pay. But you yeah. go in there, and it's like you're in the Four Seasons. But you're paying, you're getting a good product, right? Yes, that is true. You are paying. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So, so <laughs> being that being that I'm not looking for anyone to to spend any money, I think something that's forgotten sometimes is that if you're any kind of leader, director, whatever it is, um. Don't forget to go in and do like the small things. Put yourself out there. Uh, go out there and help your maintenance people rake leaves in the fall. Go out and help cook a little bit. Um, you know, go out and do some of the menial things because, you know, people forget. Uh, we ask a lot of people. And if you're not willing to do it yourself, okay, it, it does not have the same value as when they see the owner or the director out there doing the kind of stuff and go, look, how can I complain? They're doing it too. And I, and I will tell you, in the course of the day, there are so many difficult decisions that we make, sometimes doing something that you don't have to think about, whether it's sweeping something up, flipping a hamburger, doing what you're doing, is kind of refreshing. And it's, and it's, and it's very in instant gratification. So don't forget those small things and, and make sure that you put yourself out to kind of do the things that you're asking other people to do and what you get out of it will come back in spades. Yeah, it builds trust, it builds morale. 
right? When they see that, um, speaking for my wife, she did an amazing job this summer cleaning. You know, she was part of like the clean team. She'd be out there. If we were a person short, she'd be wiping down lunch tables. You know, people saw it. It meant a lot to those people. It's great advice. All right. Thank you, Mark Transport, for coming on. Appreciate it. Long it's time coming. Thanks for rep <laughs> thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for representing New York. And and um, and I'm already I'm going to give you the 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 the, pot, the day camp podcast award for best New York accent. <laughs> uh, in the history of the show, three years. All right, I love it. The boy from the Bronx representing. That's what right. happens. <laughs> we want to thank our Go Camp Pro team, our producer, Matt Hansberger, AM Skyer, commercial recreation specialist for allowing us to bring this podcast for you. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the Day Camp Pod on your favorite platform. Check out our show notes from this and other episodes at daycamppodcast.com, as well as contact information for the show, for Mark Transport, for me and for Sam Thompson and for Tiff. All right. Thank you for listening and making yourself a better camp professional. We'll be back next week with a mini pod and in two weeks with another full episode of the Day Camp Pod.